Welcome to our online service today. It's great to have you with us, wherever you might be as you watch and worship. And as we enter into worship, I'd like to begin with a greeting that I first encountered when I visited the Anglican Church in Kenya in the Kuru Diocese back in 2016. God is good all the time. All the time, God is good. Let's just spend a few moments calling to mind the things we want to bring before the Lord as we confess our sins to him. The Gospel calls us to turn away from sin and be faithful to Christ. As we offer ourselves to him in penitence and faith, we renew our confidence and our trust in his mercy. In a dark, and disfigured world, we have not held out the light of life. Lord, have mercy. In a hungry and despairing world, 
we have failed to share our bread. Christ, have mercy. In a cold and loveless world, we have kept the love of God to ourselves. Lord, have mercy. And now may God, who loved the world so much that he sent his Son to be our Saviour, forgive us our sins, and make us holy to serve him in the world. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. And now the collect, the special prayer for today. Lord God, your Son left the riches of heaven and became poor for our sake. When we prosper, save us from pride. When we are needy, save us from despair that we may trust in you alone, through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. And now Laura is going to read for us our first Bible passage. The reading is taken from Romans chapter 9, beginning at verse 1. I speak the truth in Christ. I am not lying. My conscience confirms it through the Holy Spirit. I have great sorrow and unceasing anguish in my heart, for I could wish that I myself were cursed and cut off from Christ for the sake of my people, those of my own race, the people of Israel. Theirs is the adoption to sonship, theirs the divine glory, the covenants, the receiving of the law, the temple worship and the promises. Theirs are the patriarchs, and from them is traced the human ancestry of the Messiah, who is God over all forever praised. Amen. Thank you, Laura. Paul's now going to read our Gospel passage. The Gospel reading is from Matthew chapter 14, verse 13. When Jesus heard what had happened, he withdrew by boat privately to a solitary place. Hearing of this, the crowds followed him on foot from the towns. When Jesus landed and saw a large crowd, he had compassion on them and healed their sick. As evening approached, the disciples came to him and said, This is a remote place and it's already getting late. Send the crowds away so they can go to the villages and buy themselves some food. Jesus replied, they do not need to go away. You give them something to eat. We have here only five loaves of bread and two fish, they answered. Bring them here to me, he said. And he directed the people to sit down on the grass. Taking the five loaves and the two fish and looking up to heaven, he gave thanks and broke the loaves. Then he gave them to the disciples and the disciples gave them to the people. They all ate and were satisfied. And the disciples picked up twelve basketfuls of broken pieces that were left over. The number of those who ate was about five thousand men, besides women and children. Paul, thank you for that. Now I wonder, have you ever found yourself torn between your own needs and the needs of other people? Where do we strike the balance between those claims when they seem to be pulling us in opposite directions? I suspect that for most of us, difficult decisions about our needs against the needs of others will have been a part of finding our way through this pandemic in the last few months. And our Gospel today has Jesus caught in a similar sort of quandary. Matthew has just previously told of the death of John the Baptist at the hand of King Herod. And as well as being the person who literally prepared the way for Jesus, John was also Jesus' cousin. And so, when Jesus hears the news of this, understandably, he needs some space. 
he needs to grieve, and presumably also weigh up the extent to which his own life is now in danger. So he hitches a lift on the disciple's boat and heads off somewhere secluded. But it's not to be. The trouble with sailing on a boat on a lake is twofold. Firstly, the boat can be seen, and secondly, it's not very fast, and so following on foot is not exactly difficult. And so when Jesus and the disciples land, what he finds is not a secluded spot, but rather a large crowd full of people in need. They need healing, and as time ticks by, they also need feeding. So what does Jesus do? Mindful of his own needs, jump back into the boat and try and outrun the crowds? No, as we heard, he stays to meet the crowd and to meet their needs. Why? Well, Matthew tells us it's because Jesus had compassion. Actually, that translation is a little tame. The word used is much more powerful, but not that easy to translate. It suggests an emotion so deep it is gut-wrenching or heart-rending. But let's stay with that idea of compassion for a while. We might think to ourselves, well, of course Jesus had compassion. He would, wouldn't he? But actually, we have to realise this was a radical thing for Matthew to write. Remember that the purpose of all the Gospel writers was to tell us enough in order that we might believe that Jesus is not just a great teacher, not just a healer, but rather that he is the Son of God, that he is God. Looking at Jesus answers the question that we asked a few weeks ago, what is God like? And here we see what God is like. He responds with heart-rending compassion to those who are sick and those who are poor. And we have to realise that this was a very different idea of what God is like from the many that were circulating in those times. Philosophers, for example, they tended to talk of God in remote, abstract terms, such as the first cause or the unmoved mover. The Greek and Roman religions, by contrast, were populated with a whole array of gods who behaved capriciously, using human beings almost as playthings. Now, of course, the Old Testament does indeed reveal a God of love and compassion, but in Jesus' day, it seems that all that had taken a back seat to ritual and to political expediency and appeared largely to have been forgotten. But Jesus, here is Jesus, almost moved to tears by the needs of others. And rather than use human beings as playthings, he makes himself servant of the people. And this is what God is like, not distant, not abstract, not capricious, but rather he is deeply loving, deeply caring, and deeply moved by the suffering of his people. No wonder then that it was the poor and the vulnerable who flocked to Jesus, for here was teaching about God that they needed to hear. Here was someone who didn't just talk about the love of God, he lived it too in every aspect of his life. Now, 2,000 years later, and this is still a message that people need to hear, we live in a world that is still full of suffering, not just the global pandemic that we are all going through, but in recent weeks and months we become even more aware of the injustices of racial prejudice through the reaction to the death of George Floyd. And then there are still the wars raging that bring suffering and chaos to millions of people. And we may find ourselves wanting to cry out, where is God in all of this mess? Well, the message from this passage we heard this morning is that God is a God of compassion. 
that he is deeply moved by the suffering of his people. And more than that, he will act. And he acts through countless people who demonstrate the love and compassion of God in their lives. That's why individual Christians and church communities are so involved in helping communities cope with the pandemic, are so involved in fighting for truth and justice, and are deeply involved in seeking peace in our world. Now, of course, as Christians, we work alongside countless other people in doing this work. But we do so because we know that this is what God is like and that we are called to reflect the likeness of Jesus, the likeness of God, in our day-to-day -day lives. And this is the radical message of the Gospel, that God in Jesus loves us so much that he would give, an, give up even his own life in order to rescue us. What is God like? Well, he loves us. He cares for us. And he is deeply moved by the suffering that we endure. Now, Jesus doesn't just heal the sick in this passage. He also feeds the people who are by now tired, hungry, and in the middle of nowhere, miles from the nearest shop. Well, except, of course, that it isn't Jesus who feeds the 5,000 plus in this account. It is the disciples who do it. What are we going to do, the disciples ask, as they survey the hungry people milling around them in their droves? You give them something to eat, Jesus responds. And they do. Now, in the past few weeks in our services, We've been reading and reflecting on Jesus' parables of the kingdom, his pithy little stories that illustrate the way in which God works. Now, in order to understand Jesus' miracles, it can help to think of them as being rather like enacted parables. When Jesus does something, it reveals something of the way in which God works. In St John's Gospel, he talks about Jesus' miracles as being signs, and he's very careful to spell out what each of these signs tells us about Jesus and who he is. If you remember, last week we read the parable of the mustard seed. And I wonder if the feeding of the 5,000 might be giving us a similar message. You give the people something to eat, Jesus tells his friends. We've only got five loaves and two fish, they reply. And we can probably imagine them thinking to themselves, what use is that amongst so many people? But what does Jesus do? He tells them to give him what they have. And he gives thanks. He breaks the bread. And he gives the food back to the disciples. And they then go and feed all the people who are gathered around. And more than that, with the abundance that is so characteristic of Jesus, there's masses left over after everybody has eaten their fill. It's amazing. But it starts by using what the disciples had, woefully inadequate though it might have seemed at the time. The parable of the mustard seed tells us that the smallest things can grow out of all recognition in God's kingdom. In the feeding of the 5,000, the surrender of a small pack lunch gives way to catering on an industrial scale. This is God's kingdom. This is the way that he does things. All we have to do is offer what we have and see what God can do with it. But it does start with our offering what we have, even if we think that what we have is a ridiculously inadequate offering. There is so much need. What can I do? Now that's a common enough reaction to the problems that we see around about us in the world. I think that this story of the feeding of the 5,000 encourages us to realise that if we do what we can, however little that might be, there is no limit to what God can do with it. At a time of immense 
personal sorrow and suffering, Jesus reveals to us what God is like. God cares for us and loves us deeply, and he can take our small and inadequate contribution and do wonderful things. Tony Warren is now going to lead us in prayer. Let us pray. Thanking God that we can be with one another in the Spirit, even when we're spread abroad, we pray with our brothers and sisters around the world, each bringing our particular thanksgivings and concerns. Lord God, we thank you for members of St Mary's able to be in our church building today. Thank you also for those others whom circumstances keep away, and especially for all who've helped sustain our online worship these last months. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Within the nation's wider church, we ask you to give increasing wisdom to our archbishops and to Martin, Ruth and Will, our bishops. We ask your blessing and healing for Fiona, our former archdeacon, and grace for Julia and Derek covering the vacant post. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Dear God, we ask your help for political leaders throughout the United Kingdom in all the decisions they must make, many unenviable and that Elizabeth, our Queen, may be for them a source of wise counsel. Especially since the pandemic has disrupted the life of so many, we ask you to strengthen for service workplace and health chaplains of every faith. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We ask your grace for all who suffer new restrictions, just as they've begun to enjoy a somewhat more normal life. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We know that you have the power to heal, yet the dysfunctions of a world disrupted by sin remain. But trusting you, we bring before you those we know to be troubled by accident, sickness, or unwanted circumstances of mind or body. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Loving Lord, we are more than usually aware of the deaths of friends and acquaintances, and of people who are nearing death. In your judgment, through the merit of your Son, Jesus, grant them resurrection to eternal life. Merciful Father, accept these prayers for the sake of your Son, our Saviour, Jesus Christ. Amen. And now we draw our prayers to a close by joining together in the words that Jesus himself taught us to pray. Our Father in heaven, Hallowed be your name, your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread, forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power and the glory are yours, now and for ever. Amen. And now we share the peace. We are the body of Christ. In the one spirit we were all baptised into one body. Let us then pursue all that makes for peace and builds up our common life. The peace of the Lord be always with you. Peace of the Lord be with you. Peace of the Lord be with you. The peace of the Lord. <laughs>
close, let's pray for God's blessing to rest upon us. May Christ draw you to humility and to worship, and bring you to see God at work. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be amongst you and remain with you this day and always. Amen.